Hi, I'm Michael Woods, Chief Scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. Last week in the Philippines, I gave a seminar about a continuous improvement system for turfgrass, and I think this is something that can be useful for a lot of people, so I'm going to blast through these slides and record an audio track for the things that I talked about. Whether one wants to get conditions like this um, and, and would like to rapidly move in that direction, or whether one has conditions like this and would like to maintain them, this continuous improvement system can, can accomplish that. It involves three parts. The first is to measure the soil nutrients and then adjust. The next is to measure the soil organic matter and then adjust. And a third one is to measure the surface performance and then adjust. And this is something that I didn't really understand 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but over the last five or 10 years, it's all kind of come together to me that this can be incredibly useful. And it turns out that these are techniques that are both remarkably simple and surprisingly fun to implement. Additionally, it's good for the environment because one will tend to use fewer inputs when, when using such a system. And it's, it's good for golf play too because it's virtually guaranteed to improve playing conditions. And it's certainly going to help maintain conditions at a high level if one already has them. And it might even save money too because of the possibly fewer inputs. Let's check out the first one, the measuring soil nutrients and then adjust. Now, I'd like to make it very clear that nutrient deficiencies are a very bad thing. Nutrient deficiencies can cause grass to die. And this is Pen A1 creeping bent grass grown in sand with decreasing levels of soil potassium. And when there is no potassium in the sand as at right, the grass will germinate and then it will die because there's not enough potassium for the grass to grow. I've recently been playing around with some nutrient uh, addition or nutrient withholding experiments or demonstrations at, uh, at the ATC Minami shop. And I've, uh, I've seen this grass, for example, uh, has a few rhizomes, has a few stolons, has a few leaves, has a few roots. This grass is well supplied with all the nutrients it requires. And when I saw how good this grass was growing, I wondered if I could do the opposite and uh, make some grass perform not so well by withholding nutrients. On October 1st, I planted a variety of grasses taking three centimeter diameter plugs, that's just over an inch, plugs of, plugs of established grass, planting them in the center of these pots and then fertilizing them either with nitrogen nitrogen plus potassium plus phosphorus, or NPK plus also calcium and magnesium in the form of dolomite. Let's look at the tiff eagle plots. That's right in the center of the frame, and the one at left has nitrogen only. This is on October 18th, so it's after uh, less than three weeks. In the center, it's N plus P plus K, and at right, it also has dolomite. Not a huge difference there, but it does look like the nitrogen only isn't quite growing so vigorously. By 28 days uh, at left, the nitrogen only plot hasn't grown nearly as much as the ones that were supplied with phosphorus and with potassium. And after 45 days, there's a dramatic difference where the N only plot isn't growing well. Now, um, I was surprised to see this happen after only 45 days to see such a big difference. And I think that this is something that should be prevented. So how do we do that? Well, we can do that by soil testing. And I'm going to show some charts uh, from, from data from Keio Golf Club in Japan where I have soil test data for the uh, seven-year sequence. First, the soil phosphorus. Let's look at this chart. On the x-axis, it's showing dates going from 2013 up to 2019. On the y-axis, it shows the quantity of phosphorus extracted by a Malik 3 soil test. And the blue line is the average of all ATC putting green samples. And the, the orange line down at the bottom, that's set at 21 parts per million, which is the MLSN minimum guideline. And what we want to do is make sure that the phosphorus stays above that guideline. Well, in 2013, 2014, there was almost 200 parts per million phosphorus. I've not recommended any phosphorus in any of these soil test events. And you can see finally it starts to trend down going um, 
from 184 down to 80 in the most recent sampling. As the, the soil test phosphorus continues to go down, as it approaches the minimum guideline, the recommendation can then be made to add some phosphorus. For potassium, it's slightly different. The chart's laid out in the same way though, but now we're looking at the potassium in the soil rather than the phosphorus. And the average of all ATC putting green samples tested is almost 75 parts per million for, for this element. And the minimum guideline for potassium is 37 parts per million. So I would like people to keep their soil test potassium above 37 parts per million, which is a level that I'm confident is gonna supply enough to produce excellent turf grass. In this case, you can see that the potassium has been bouncing around just above this guideline, and I've adjusted the recommendations, and the golf course superintendent at Kea Golf Club for these past seven years, Andrew McDaniel, has applied potassium according to these recommendations, where we just slightly adjust the potassium ratio to uh, the nitrogen to potassium ratio to ensure that the grass is supplied with enough potassium and to make sure that the minimum guideline is not reached as far as what's in the soil. The results of this are, well, if you soil test and then apply, you, you make sure that you're apply, applying the correct fertilizer. The grass is supplied with all the nutrients it can use, so that means you're going to have some pretty healthy grass. Unnecessary fertilizer applications are eliminated, which is a great thing, and there's reduced risk of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. Those elements are especially uh, risky in terms of polluting water bodies, and if you have healthier grass with a, with a better root system, that's going to capture more of those elements by uh, um, avoiding unnecessary fertilizer applications. One won't be putting phosphorus that's not required, and it's, it's all a good thing. And here's some pictures of the results. Uh, this grass gets a lot of traffic uh, during the, the professional tournament, the KBC Augusta tournament that's held there each year. The greens are mowed multiple times a day. The greens are rolled multiple times a day. And it, the, traffic, uh, the traffic is pretty intense and the turf stands up very well. Uh, it grows well in, in sun. It grows well in shade. There's no ball marks. It, uh, it's a tremendous surface produced by testing the soil, making sure that enough nutrients are supplied to stay above those minimum guidelines. And uh, for example, no, fo no phosphorus applied because it wasn't required for the past seven years. Now the, the next thing I talked about is measuring soil organic matter. And I want to talk specifically about the total soil organic matter. Um, this is, is kind of a tricky topic because the Soil Science Society of America, they have an online glossary where they define what soil organic matter is. And soil organic matter is defined as the organic fraction of the soil excluding the undecayed plant and animal matter. Now, when we think about managing thatch or managing the organic matter at the surface of a golf course putting green, we as turfgrass managers would definitely be thinking about a lot of that undecayed matter, the, the stems, the stolons, the rhizomes, the roots, the, the material that makes up the thatch. And that's excluded from a standard soil organic matter test because it gets screened off and removed at the laboratory before any uh, before any testing is done. So I'm going to talk about the total organic matter and I think it's important to test that because sand top dressing and core aerification are done to manage that and this is this can be very disruptive to play. Now this is a lot of sand on a green. The purpose to make it smoother also to manage the soil organic matter. This is sand top dressing being applied. I would rather putt on the portion of the green that doesn't have sand on it some people have, have talked to me recently and suggested that perhaps the ball can roll better when there's sand on the green. I, uh, I think they, okay, they might be right, but I would still rather not put the sand and I'd rather putt on, on the grass. 
and coring is is quite disruptive and again i i think the greens probably putted better before the coring than they did after the coring now these practices might be necessary um, for other purposes but uh, i just want to talk about the role of organic matter here there's a video of how the ball bounced last august at uh, at Kea Golf Club during the KBC Augusta tournament. And I'm just going to show that video now. The ball bounces quite well. And I thought this was interesting because it had rained so much. This is after raining for about a week every day, and the ball still bounced quite well. And how is this managed or how does one assess this organic matter? Well, the total organic matter, I like to measure it by depth. So you, you take plugs or cores from the green and then you measure the depth and cut them to depth. So for example, you've got the grass at the top and uh, this going down into the soil and one can cut it into sections. I like to cut at a zero to two centimeters two to four centimeters and two to, uh, sorry, four to six centimeters. That's equivalent to zero to, uh, a depth of zero being the surface down to 0 0.8 inches. And then the next section would be from 0 0.8 down to 1.6 inches. And the third section would be from 1.6 down to 2.4 inches. So it's a little bit more sensitive to, to small changes than uh, it is going inch by inch. I like to burn this. I don't, uh, I don't want to do anything to it at the lab. I want to, to measure all the organic matter. So I don't want to screen out any of the undecayed material. And I like to measure it at 400, 440 degrees, burning, burning off the organic matter at that temperature. I did a comparison at Brookside Labs in Ohio and burning this type of sample at only 360 degrees still leaves a little bit of residue. We're burning it at 440, gets rid of all the stems, all the rhizomes, uh, and, and leaves us with something that looks like perfectly clean sand after the burn. This is a result, this is a chart that shows what type of results one can expect, and, and the samples from the Philippines from different grass species are highlighted in color here. And I've uh, put on the, on the horizontal axis the amount of organic matter in the soil, the weight loss on ignition by burning at 440 degrees Celsius. And on the vertical y-axis, it starts at zero at the surface. So that first uh, row near, near the surface is the zero to two centimeter depth. And then it goes down um, to the two to four centimeter depth and the four to six centimeter depth. These results show that it's, it's pretty common to have samples near the surface from a, a little bit under 5% up to 20%. Um, as you go deeper into the soil profile, there's less organic matter. Uh, it would be uncommon to have more than 5% or total organic matter at a two to four centimeter depth and almost unheard of on putting grains to be above 5% down at the four to six centimeter depth. But I think more, even more interesting than a snapshot is to look at it over, over time. And this is at Kea Golf Club. Remember, we've, we've looked at the video of how the ball bounced. And uh, this is how the organic matter has trended over time. So the, there was an average of 11% in samples taken in 2017. This went up to 13% in 2018, and it, it continued trending up to 14% this year. So it seems to me that in the top two centimeters, there's an increasing amount of organic matter. And if I wanted the surfaces to get firmer, I would probably want that trend to be going in the, the opposite direction. I'd rather see the organic matter be going down a little bit. Now, I'm not too sure about some of these recommendations for 6% or less organic matter right at the surface. Uh, that's kind of a standard recommendation. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily uh, required in all cases because 
um, the, the surfaces were plenty firm at, at this location with uh, 11% and with 13 and with 14% organic matter. It, it's really interesting also to look a little bit deeper in the profile. At the 2 to 4 centimeter depth over those same years, it's, it's basically unchanged, hovering right around 3, 4, 3%. 3 and at the 4 to 6 centimeter depth, 3, 3% 3 over the years. So the organic matter is only accumulating right at the surface in the top 0 0.8 inches. It seems to me that coring would not be necessary. There, uh, solid tining and then filling those holes with sand would not be necessary. It doesn't seem necessary at this location to inject sand deeper into the profile. Uh, and, and it would seem that top dressing right at the surface or scarifying to remove organic matter and adding sand right at the surface would be sufficient. Now, there, there may be other reasons why verticutting or why core aerification would be required, but in terms of organic matter management, uh, it doesn't seem those would be required at depth at this location. So I really like to look at this number over time. I think it's incredibly useful. And a third, a third thing that should be measured and adjusted as part of this continuous improvement program is surface performance. And there was an excellent article by Chris Hartwiger in the Green Section Record just this month in, in early November of 2019. The article is available in the Green Section Record. It's called A Year of Measuring Putting Green Performance. And Chris Hartwiger in the article recommended keeping records of these things. He, he divided them into categories. Um, a couple things that, that he suggested measuring as key performance indicators include green speed and clipping volume. And then he recommended keeping track of cultural inputs and conditions such as the weather, nitrogen applications, sand top dressing applications, the timing of those and the rates. By the way, for sand top dressing, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to express that as a depth, which, which is the volume divided by the area. And also keep track of surface maintenance practices like the mowing details, the rolling details, and so on. This is something that I've done not year round, but uh, I've had the opportunity to be involved at KIA Golf Club during their tournament, the KBC Augusta tournament that's held the last week of August every year. And I've measured, made intensive measurements of the green speed and the surface firmness and the soil moisture and some weather conditions during the tournament over the past seven years. And with the um, with this continuous improvement system, with the measuring of clipping volume, which is really easy to do, uh, just uh, dumping the clippings into a bucket, measuring measuring what the volume is, the tournament green speed from 2013 up to 2019 has gotten to where it's right at the upper end of the target range. And it's it's been remarkable to see how the maintenance staff at KIA Golf Club have been able to utilize these data uh, from, from measuring the surface performance, um, knowing what the, the green speed is, knowing what the clipping volume is, knowing what work is done, knowing what work was done and what the weather conditions were, that, that um, led to these conditions to where now it seems really predictable that in 2020, they'll be able to target a certain nitrogen rate, a certain growth rate that they can assess by the clipping volume, a, a certain mowing frequency and mowing height. And it seems very likely that they will be able to achieve the same type of green speed that they're looking for. And for the surface hardness, or the ball bounce on the greens uh, as measured by the clay hammer. The first few years uh, of, of collecting data in 2013, 2014, 2015, the, the surfaces just didn't quite get as firm as we would have liked. Over the last four years, they've, they've achieved those levels. And it's interesting that this has also been associated with less core aerification uh, in fact, none, I think, since 2016, and less solid tine aerification. Although, if you saw the trend in organic matter, it seems that at some point it would get a little bit too much organic matter at the surface, and maybe the surface hardness would not be as desired. 
it's it's been something that surprised me at how useful this is and it um, putting it all together um, one gets healthy grass one has minimal in inputs and one has excellent playing conditions and one has beautiful beautiful turf grass so this continuous improvement system involves soil testing uh, to measure the soil nutrients keeping them above minimal guidelines but certainly avoiding any unnecessary applications about uh, then there's also the the part about measuring the total soil organic matter that's something that that I find really useful and especially looking at the trends over time because the idea is uh, if if one uh, doesn't need to core aerify and one doesn't need to top dress so much um, the soil organic matter data will show that if one needs to aerify or top dress more the soil organic matter data and the changes over time will also show that and then this can all be confirmed and assessed and further adjusted by some careful measurements of surface performance and there's plenty more information about this at my website asianturfgrass.com thanks so much